Hi, I'm Sandy Barron, and I want to welcome you back to the Media Apocalypse, our series about the threats facing journalism, news gathering, and the flow of information on matters of public concern in our democracy, and dedicated to exploring solutions, both legal and otherwise, for preserving the press function. Um, here with Ron L. Anderson, Scott Shapiro, Jack Balkin, and Ben Smith. Um, ben Smith is media columnist for the New York Times. Uh, he joined the Times earlier this year, 2020, after spending eight years as the founding editor in chief of BuzzFeed News. Before that, he covered politics for Politico, the New York Daily News, the New York Observer, and the New York Sun, and he reported for the Indianapolis Star and in Europe for the Baltic Times and the Wall Street Journal Europe. Thank you, Ben, for joining us. And thanks for having me. I want to start by getting to the heart of some of the issues that we're looking at in this series. We're looking at the stress, in particular, the economic stress, under which a significant percentage of news organizations, really in all forms of media, are operating under today. The New York Times perhaps accepted. Um, we've heard a number of options that could, if there was proper policy and political will, be used to help support news gathering operations. So from your vantage point, both from your years truly as a journalist in a number of publications, as the founding editor of BuzzFeed News, and now as a media columnist, what do you think are the most important functions that news organizations perform that could or should be used to sell the value of the press to the public? Gosh, that's the, that is uh, the notion of thing. I don't usually think in terms of like the press function, the way, the way you lawyers talk, um, but, and um, that's a really good question. I mean, I think, I think but, you know, part of the issue right now is that you know, everybody says they hate the media, but then every couple of publications they like. And I think the question of who kind of quote unquote the public is, is also obviously very, very divided. And there, there's a large group of Americans for whom like the New York Times and CNN have become like almost like religious institutions that they you know, worship. And then and, and if you work for them, they thank you for what you do, like you're like a priest. And then, um, and then for a lot of Americans, you know, these are the sort of partisan enemies of President Trump. And, he, and so, I mean, I, I don't think it makes sense to sort of approach those two groups the same way. I mean, I think in some sense, the question is like, can the, is there a way to win back the trust of the second group of people who, who you know, have been the subject of a really intense campaign against the media from a politician they really like and admire? Um, and you know, I, I guess my own instinct is that there's there's not some silver bullet, not some magic door back to 1962, um, but that and but that on a local, you know, people when you get away from the incredibly toxic, divisive national conversation, and people engage with news at a local level or at you know a story about their high school or about some institution that really touches them. A lot of the craziness goes away, and and there is a fair amount of trust in that. I mean, just in my experience, in your coverage of that institution, if you do a good job, and I think there's a lot of like, I don't know. I think it's basically not one story, but that there is a lot of that that when you sort of move it out of when you move news and media out of the sort of CNN, MSNBC, Fox News political conversation, people respond to it very differently and better. I know you've had plenty of experience with local news operations. And um, I, I, I hope it's fair to say that I know that you're married to someone who is the publisher and editor of one. Um, with that in mind, and, 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 and I may double back on this question of functions that, that you perform that we should be valuing, but do you really see a future for local news? They, local news operations are probably under more uh, economic stress than the paper you work for. 
Oh yeah, and I think you know met metropolitan newspapers are sort of continuing down in the, their death spiral, but you know, but I think there are new models emerging for local news, and people just I would just say that people engage local news totally differently, and can and I think there's a way in which you see these new nonprofits emerging around the country, in particular that present it as sort of a civic function, and I think people are really willing to engage it that way. And it's sort of interesting if you look at what the city in New York is doing, its new publication. Or, or city bureau in Chicago, there you know it's a it's a kind of journalism that is much closer to the community than I think <laughs> newspaper journalism was ever really comfortable with. Um, that's what Brooklyner, my, which my wife's publication, which everyone should subscribe to, does too. And I think um, I don't know. I mean, I think there's. I, I guess I do think that you're starting to see between nonprofits and just sort of the emergence of subscription on the internet that, you know, that people are willing to pay for subscriptions, you are starting to see these models emerge that for, for local news. That's more optimistic on some level than we- I mean, it's sort of optimistic. I mean, the problem is you still have these kind of tottering institutions that employ thousands and thousands of journalists that are slowly collapsing. Yeah, yeah. Well, looking at the, structural issues, if you will, of running news organizations, what structure, structural barriers or challenges have you seen? And I, I, I assume you'd be drawing mostly from your, or more than anything from your time at BuzzFeed to sustaining, let alone growing a hard news operation. Oh, I mean, you know, like vastly the main one is the extent to which Facebook and Google have dominated the advertising industry, industry, driven down rates and chased everybody else out. I mean, it's just it's just sort of like that was the main source of revenue for the news industry for a hundred years, you know, in a weird coincidental way. Like it's kind of odd that advertising was the main source of revenue, but that was the fact. And, you know, Google and Facebook both built a better mousetrap and like acquired all the other mousetrap companies um, in a way that, you know, that is just, a, that really hit even the most sort of, I remember when I worked for BuzzFeed, even the most kind of dynamic, innovative new players really hard, or at least kind of capped our growth. And if you were, you know, trying to figure out how to get from print to the internet, it was a really bad time doing it because you were just, there was no money there. Yeah. Um, I, I won't ask you if you're planning to write about the uh, House of Representatives report and the consolidation of, uh, of tech uh, for, for the times. Um, Agree. Would you have said, however, that the economics, the problems that you, that BuzzFeed would face economically, influenced the substance or form of the content that you put out, the the, the stories you commissioned, you asked your reporters to cover, and the stuff you actually put out over the feed. I mean, you know, these things are fundamentally businesses, and you can only hire as many reporters as you can afford. I, I don't think that's necessarily. Um, like, I mean, I, I mean, I don't think, you know, I mean, I think, you know, we were, and, you know, to some degree and did really build a viable business in part around news. Um, but I think, you know, I think it just, what you really, you had basically Facebook and Google absorbing all the new ad dollars. It wasn't that existing ad advertising businesses weren't surviving. It was that all the growth in the industry was going to these two companies, which left and everybody else was capped, you know, and so you didn't, you, so I think everybody's trajectory sort of flattened and went down in terms of their ability to build a newsroom, among other things. Yeah. Um, Ron, I'm going to turn it over now. I've got, I, I'd love to continue this part, but I'm going to give it over to Ron L. Ron L., take it away. Thanks, Andy, um, and thanks, Ben, for joining us. Um, you tapped into something that we've talked about a lot um, here in our conversation group about the divide between um, the sort of old model legacy journalism organizations that seem to be thriving at this critical moment and those that seem to be imploding. Um, and I wanted to just sort of um, ask you to sort of plumb the depths of that a little bit, just to think about what's lost um, when we lose the ones that implode and when we shift power to the ones uh, that survive. So uh, what is it exactly that you think is lost in a media environment in which, um, you know, the New York Times and Washington Post are absolutely flourishing, um, but um, those strong regional papers, I'm thinking, you know, the Denver Post, the uh, Columbus Dispatch, the Arizona Republics of the World, um, turn out not to be able to stay afloat. 
Um, what are the consequences for, I mean, both for sort of the checking function at the state and local level, the kind of the kind of thing that the New York Times and the Washington Post might be doing for us at the, at the sort of for the federal government, uh, but that we don't have happening um, in a governmental way um, on a local or regional uh, basis, but also sort of what, what do you think might be the wider consequences, you know, for um, losing local or regional shapers of conversation on matters of public concern that are distinct to those areas? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you know what you describe, right? Like you've got like the Washington Post, the, you know, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the journal, and then like this huge cliff, um, you know, is, is sort of the shape of every digital industry, right? Like you've got Google, and then like maybe you got Bing, and then nobody else, right? Like the, these, these sort of internet businesses tend to, because they have this incredible scale, and they're so transparently competitive, like consolidate around when they're, um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the most, but the thing, I, the thing that I really notice in a way is like, is that you lose like the Congressional Bureau of the Denver Post, you lose like this sort of pull, you know, kind of a pull on the center that's coming from different directions. I mean, you also lose these pipelines of journalists who have come coming from different places. Um, I would just say though, like, like, you know, the Denver Post maybe has 10 reporters today, maybe it had 20 last year. It's been a long, time since these papers were healthy, like 15, 20 years. Like, it's, and, and people say that, you know, they're, they're like owned by these kind of vulture hedge funds, but like the feature of vultures is they eat things that are already dead. And I don't, and I think that like, there's a certain amount of nostalgia for those places, but they're basically gone. And I think the sort of, you do see, I think it's like civic leaders around the country and the kind of people who used to give a lot of money to the ballet, realizing that giving a lot of money to some local news nonprofit is important because it's like the you know it's like a ut public utility. Um, and is that true? Are they doing it? Yes, actually. It? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I don't know about Denver, but certainly in a lot of yeah, you're sort of seeing it in different forms in a lot of places, and it doesn't have the kind of um, like the mass scale of a daily newspaper that fifty percent of people in the city read. But the reality is that people read that for the sports scores anyway. And nobody was ever reading the story about the city council. And the most important thing about the city council reporter was just that he or she was like showing up to the meeting and making these people feel like someone was watching them. And um, I think you're starting to, I, I guess my, so I do think that that's starting to come back and that it's, and that it is really important, you know, that these sort of civic minded news organizations, which may not reach a mass audience, right? Like, I think there's another problem of like people in, you know, Des Moines are not super interested in the doings of the Des Moines City Council that is a, like a different societal issue. But I don't know. I think that there's there, like there's two different things. There's the like Americans should eat their spinach and there's the like we should we should be like serving spinach even if nobody wants to eat it. And I think we're like making more progress on the latter. Right, yeah. I mean, we've talked about that a lot with other folks about the sort of disaggregation of all of those functions that um, the community newspaper once served, and the at least some of those people on their way to the sports scores, you know, stumbled upon a headline or two about what was happening in uh, the city council that maybe no longer do. Now you've got um, a publication called The Athletic that hired the best sports reporter in town, centralized the sports conversation, and you don't have to subscribe to the newspaper anymore. Right, yeah. Um, so sort of related to that question about what the, um, you know, sort of what uh, the uh, societal democratic obligations of journalists are, I want to, um, I want to ask you about some things that some recent guests of ours have suggested about the journalistic function, particularly in this era, in the Trump era, and in um, a moment of um, vilification of the press. Um, by the president, but um, sort of more broadly than that, what uh, some folks are sort of defining as uh, an attempt to you know, profit from the re reduction of trust in truth and um, truth telling institutions like the press. Um, uh, we had uh, Jay Rosen on a while back and I'm sure um, you're familiar with sort of his um, schemata, right? I mean, he, he feels really strongly that um, journalists and journalism at this moment are sort of uh, continuing to follow and abide by old norms at a time when government and particularly uh, the president have you know, uh, completely abandoned all of those old norms. Um, and he made an argument to us that journalists engage um, in this sort of continued quest to appear objective when what the public is relying on at this critical moment of crisis is um, information that is helpful, that advances us as a democracy and not that old sort of objectivity 
role. Um, he, he said uh, to us, I'm just going to read it, um, journalists are mostly seeking refuge rather than seeking truth, right? Seeking to be able, um, when, um, that, when it's argued that they were biased or that they were um, engaging in partisan behavior, that they could say, uh, look, we also ran this other story on this other candidate, or we um, had both sides on to talk about climate change and uh, to uh, deny climate change. Um, and I just uh, sort of want to tap into your views as a person who covers the press and um, covers uh, press companies and press behaviors, sort of what insights do you have to offer on the criticisms um, that news organizations are facing about sort of both sizing and advancing objectivity, you know, rather than advancing, I guess, rather than advancing democracy? Do you think that those two things are at odds? And what are your views on, um, on that um, general strain of scholarship that seems to be emerging right now? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, these are basically straw men and it's an argument that's going, going on for many, many years, or, you know, and, and honestly, I mean, I, it's, I find myself agreeing with Jay a lot these days, but I think of him a little as like a stopped clock who is right now. I mean, in 20, when I was covering politics in 2012, there were a lot of people saying, why won't you say that Mitt Romney is a liar and a fascist? Mitt Romney is a liar and a fascist and that but I think that then when you see somebody who is telling blatant lies and acting in a sort of demagogic authoritarian way, and you say that because you think it, that doesn't mean that when you didn't say it last time, it was because you were both sizing or refusing to speak hard truths. Like maybe the reality changed. And in fact, that like the, you know, this fact, I mean, I think that it's, this is a really genuinely unusual situation. This isn't just like the, the this is like, the fact that the media is covering Donald Trump differently from the way it covered other presidents isn't like primarily a story about the media being different. It's a story about the presidency being different. Um, I do think that there are these really bad reflexes around, for sure, around, um, yes, yeah, throwing up your hands and, and letting both sides talk, particularly about like, you know, allegedly complex policy issues um, like climate. Um, where you know, or public health, where it's like actually there's a consensus of experts and this isn't complicated. Um, but I think there's also sometimes, uh, you know, I'm glad Jay is so sure he knows what is true. But sometimes you have to be like humble as a reporter about not always knowing what is true and who is right. And and if you don't know, you shouldn't guess. And is it your sense um, that they uh, that they should be doing something different? at this, so two part question, is it, is it your sense that they should be doing something different um, at this moment? That is that the press function in democracy uh, should have tilted in some way at this moment. Um, and is there a, a risk that the thing that you're thinking is unique about the Trump administration might have residual effect long-term, um, both you know for the democracy, right, but, but also just for, for the way that um, the press ought to cover government? Oh, for sure. I mean, I think there's all sorts of long-term damage. Like I think probably his supporters will never trust most media. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, again, I, I, don't, I don't think it's quite that sort of simple or binary. I think, you know, there were a lot of, there was a lot of bad journalism in 2016 and a lot of like not taking Trump seriously or taking the wrong things seriously that I think people are very aware of and just sort of an unwillingness to say like this guy is lying. I think people were just shocked by that and didn't know what to do. Um, you know, you'll notice that like the Times and other institutions are calling Trump a liar now. Not clear to me that that has profoundly changed its audience's opinions. Like, I'm not sure that that many New York Times readers who picked up the paper and said, oh my God, like now I think Trump is bad. Now that I've read the, I, you know, it's just the headline calling him a liar. I didn't really read the story. I mean, I just don't, I don't know. If, I'm not, I think it's good, it's worthy, but I'm not really like, I, don't, I think it's kind of lower stakes than people tend to think. I mean, I guess I do think that, you know, Trump really is fundamentally still a creature of television. And by far, you know, I mean, too, obviously he's on Twitter a lot and he kind of uses it to program television and to comment on television, but he is fundamentally this television figure. And I think, you know, to the degree that there's, when I think the, like the history books are written, I think it will be about The Apprentice and sort of the ce celebrity reality TV. It'll be about what's CNN in particular in 2016. And the, you know, the way in which, you know, po like, the, you know, the cable news turned politics into this sort of like terrifying adrenaline sh shout fest that people are kind of addicted to. Probably, I think more than other forms for what it's worth. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm gonna hand it off to Scott. Hi, Ben, thank you so much. Um, uh, I just, uh, so people, 
used to talk um, about the BuzzFeed model, um, uh, kind of content aggregation, click the links, listicles, all that stuff. Um, and uh, I was, you know, you know, you were founding um, uh, editor uh, of BuzzFeed News, and I'm, I was curious. And now that you're in the Times, which is it has has obviously a very very different economic model. I was hoping you could talk about what you think the the um, the future of BuzzFeed's, not not BuzzFeed itself, of course, but that model is for um, uh, internet news companies going forward. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, people did talk about the BuzzFeed model a lot and meant all sorts of different things at different times. Um, I think that for businesses, and there are a handful of them, Vox Media is probably the other big one, medium-sized one. Um, the Times is certainly one. For businesses that have, because I think it's easy to like sort of talk in broad strokes about this sort of crisis in media and crisis in journalism. By the way, like the economy, you know, these are businesses that depend in all sorts of ways on the general economy, which is in trouble. Um, but actually, there, you know, there's a bunch of different things happening. There are these metro newspapers, you know, that have these, you know, that are in print and are dealing with the decline of print still, like just huge, I think, for basically insoluble secular problems. And then, you know, I think for, you know, companies that have figured out how to make money on the internet and for increasing non advertising ways, but are, you know, bringing in really meaningful, I think BuzzFeed has reported $300 million a year in revenue. Um, you know, it's not like there's there's a recession right now, but it's not like it's not like the internet is going away or that people are shopping less on the internet, people are consuming less on the internet, that there's some other thing coming to replace digital media and cons consumption on mobile devices. And so I think I still I think basically, you know, I, I, I don't I don't think I think those companies will have their ups and downs, but are you know, are have built sustainable businesses. And the thing with the media business is that it's like it's a really boring business. Like we're not trading credit default swaps here. Like we sell advertisements, we sell subscriptions, like we help you buy, you know, pots and pans, like whatever. Um, and good media companies have five or six. If you look at like what's Disney's main business, it's like, well, it has like nine different revenue lines, which it like manages very carefully. Um, and they're these sort of boring, diversified companies. Nobody's trading credit default swaps. And um, and I think you're starting to see sort of more mature digital businesses, and obviously like Netflix on the high end of that, um, that are here to stay. What, 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 if you had to, uh, when you were uh, at BuzzFeed, or imagine yourself at BuzzFeed right now, what would you want Congress to do the most? If the one thing that Congress could do to help you? Yeah, if I was speaking as like a sort of, like I do think that a lot, like there's a certain amount of stuff, of arguments that get like, cast as like um, ideological and moral arguments that are really just like an industrial fight between the distributors and the content creators. Um, and right now the landscape is just massively tilted toward the distributors. And I, and I mean, I kind of think what Australia is doing right now is really interesting. And, you know, a lot, and it's actually, it's, it's hard to pay attention to because it's in Australia, but lots of senior executives at Facebook are on conference calls until three in the morning every night because of Australia. Um, and basically, they they put their main, I guess he's sort of the competition regulator, this guy named Rod Sims, who's a, who has spent his career um, on like railroad and port deregulation. Regulation. And they have like a very aggressive competition authority that's basically, if you operate a port, and it's, the only, it's obviously like the only place to dock in Perth, we're going to sort of like simulate a market in which there were seven ports. And we're going to say like, well, what would it cost to dock at this port if actually there were seven of them? And we're just going to force you to charge that. And so I think they're now in the process of saying like, well, like imagine there were seven search engines and news companies were selling their content to each of those search engines because they wanted news. All right, we're gonna order Google to pay that. And Google is losing its mind over this and threatening to leave the country as is Facebook. Um, and it's obviously, I think the strings are being pulled to some degree by News Corp. Um, but I think there are versions of that model that, you know, that are gonna, I mean, that's the most aggressive, but I think you're gonna see Some, I mean, I don't antitrust in this country, you all know more about it than I do, but I think it's obviously much less enforceable than it is in some of these other markets. But I think they're starting to get pushed into these models where they're gonna have to pay for content that they use. And I think that'd be great. Um, so um, uh, I wanna 
just kind of flip to now the New York Times, now that, uh, that, you, that you're out at the New York Times, and a lot of talk, um, as of course you know, um, about um, not having a both sides um, uh, model. Um, and the, 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 the question is whether you imagine uh, the big broadsheets in the United States, the New York Times, Was uh, Wall Street Journal, uh, Washington Post, maybe the LA Times, or some, uh, th those big national broadsheets, whether they're moving, whether you, can you see them moving more towards the European model of partisan newspapers, much like, if you will, Fox News moving cable news to a partisan model in the 90s? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the long-term trend, and it's a business trend. The ad, you know the ad, the weirdness of the advertising business is that you know you're trying to reach everybody who buys mattresses, and so you want to be kind of as milk toast as possible because you don't want to alienate anybody except everybody who buys mattresses. Um, and the subscription business is the opposite. You want to like super serve your fans um, and the people. And, and you know, the Times, I think it's, it's you know it's sort of big stretch goal is to get 10 million subscriptions, which would be incredible and would be like a great business. Like it's time has become a great business, but obviously that's one in 30 Americans, right? It's not trying to talk to everybody. Like the absolute best case means most people do not subscribe to the New York Times and that's fine. And so I think the management of the Times and the family that owns the Times don't like this idea and, and are resisting it, but that the basic pull of the business model is toward a more partisan point of view. I say, I, I mean, what do, uh, do, you, do, do you do you have a view that is um, like, do, do you think this would be um, a more honest form of media if we if I mean, it, I'm it, more honest. Yeah, I, well, I guess I would put it differently. Like, I think that I would that good media is honest, but I don't think honesty always winds up telling your partisans what they want to hear. I mean, true partisans believe that honesty always lies in telling them what they want to hear. But I think journalism, like, you want to be open to being surprised. And I think that there is a risk of sort of, you know, of kind of like, I mean, but ultimately, I guess my own, my real view is that different, different, there are lots of different publications and they have different functions and sort of different people and that there isn't really one standard. Okay, so let me be really direct. What about the New York Times? That is, um, do you think it would be better um, that as you produced, you would produce more accurate, informative stories if reporters were unleashed, um, unconstrained to be able to say the president is lying? Um, uh, and for, and for, but here's a good, I mean, I think, I guess maybe I'm, I'm much more like tactical in the way I think about this, I guess, but like, for instance, I don't know what truth Peggy Haberman's heart is about how she feels about Donald Trump. Do I think if her job involved in the morning getting up and delivering an impassioned monologue for three minutes about whatever she kind of thought that day and felt, whether that would make New York Times readers better or worse informed of what was happening in America? Like, obviously worse. Like, she's the absolute best source on what's happening in the White House. And that's partly because she holds her cards pretty close on what she thinks. And like, good. Meanwhile, like, am I glad that Edward Snowden went to Glenn Greenwald? And him all those documents and he did it because Greenwald does in fact deliver you know 90,000 word impassioned monologues every day and exactly what he thinks like yes and I and I want both I want the story of the Trump White House and what's really happening and I want the Snowden story and I don't really have like a sort of moral or ethical point of view on whether a reporter's own confessions and chest thumping and posturing or not play into that I, 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 that that's uh, so. If I understand what you're saying, and it seems like a very uh, right. uh, we, we have we have an editor, so edit this out. So don't worry. Um, but um, just to get just to get um, um, it straight. So I what I hear you saying is that it different reporters have different functions within a newspaper, and it would be fine if if some of the more editorial reporters had a certain view, uh, had a certain tone and style, and more of the beat reporters have another style, but they could all coexist within the same newspaper. I'm not even really saying that. I guess I'm just, I think I think the function of these or of the news organizations to tell you stuff you didn't know about what's happening in the world. 
and I'm kind of agnostic on how that information emerges, I guess, within the terms of like legality. Like okay, you well, it. although if somebody stole it and gave it to you, that would be a great scoop. <laughs> okay. Okay. Like TM, you know, and we're going to, for instance, we are likely to learn, you know, there was that Donald Trump visit to Walter Reed last year that remains like a mystery. Yes. Like likely we will learn what happened from TMZ, which notoriously pays people, which has been alleged to steal documents. Um, I'll be really interested in knowing what happened. Yeah, I, I obviously, when we were talking about the ethics of it, I didn't mean whether they should violate the law or, or whether they should engage in sleazy behavior. What I meant to say is whether it would produce more informative, accurate reporting if, if um, journalists were permitted by their newspaper to state what they think uh, rather than censoring themselves and putting it in a kind of um, you know, more neutral tone. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it, I think it depends. I think there are probably areas where journalists broadly have really, like have a lot of expertise. I think places where journalists have a lot of expertise and good judgment are places. I mean, I think actually race is an interesting one where there's been this like basically long tradition in American media that if you were a black reporter, we really, you know, the, the institution really wanted you in the newsroom, but also did not wanted you to bite your tongue on issues of racism that you had a lot of experience with. And that, like, that's a good example of a place where I think the line really ought to move. Um, do I think that, you know, mostly college ed educated reporters tastes in sort of class tastes ought to, instead of propriety ought to like, and sort of social cues ought to like, dominate because it's their preference like probably not like i would probably want you to do a fair review of a tele of like a show that like wasn't for you because you had a fancy college degree right i i, I, I think there's, well, there's a huge spectrum of stuff okay. and it's kind of it's complicated and that like the core function of the paper really isn't to position itself as politically it's to deliver you information just to be clear i wasn't saying that like <laughs> it should turn it Sorry, into did, I, did I sort of straw man you there? Yeah, I think you did, but that's okay. Um, my job is to say you straw man me. Um, uh, that it just it just seems like um, instead of, uh, that it's not either like completely bland both sides versus screed. It's yeah. it's more like if the guy's obviously lying, can you say he's lying? Um, and yeah. Um, right. and, and you that, use the word racism when what you think you perceive is racism as compared to racially tinged or something else. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and when you're using kind of skills of language that feels like it makes no sense. Yeah, you should be able to, I mean, you should be able to say to your reader or whatever you're saying to your colleagues in plain English. And I think about, we did a pretty good job of that at BuzzFeed. And I think that's not, I mean, the Times, you know, big institutions have a sort of way of speaking that's, I find a little stilted, but you know. Although interestingly, the times, I, it seems to me, I've been, I, I'm thinking of Peter Baker in particular, that they, they slap an analysis on it and they turn it loose. Um, and maybe they've always done that and I'm just noticing it. Um, but I had the sense the times, in fact, was doing more of just what Scott, Scott may be talking about. Yeah, I think it's also easier to calls and strikes when like the pitcher is like throwing into the right field <laughs> you know like like a lot of these things are like I mean it's so nuts out there right now and so I think like in a way it's it's not I think it isn't so much like we need to rethink journalistic traditions I mean it's partly that but also in some places but also like like it's one thing to, to try to reflect both sides on a close call when you can't quite tell it's another when like things are just like wildly out of sync and Trump is saying lunatic stuff and it's not and, and I think that's a specific thing that's really happening it's important to be able to say that and not make it a sort of abstract argument about journalism right I I, I got you um uh, thank you so much I'm gonna turn this over to Jack thank you uh -oh. uh, Ben I have to say that I was gonna ask a whole bunch of different questions but this last conversation is so interesting that I just want to keep going with it uh -oh. and so a pardon me for being a law professor, but earlier you said uh, 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 the, the point of news is to tell you stuff you didn't know. And I'm going to say, I want you to walk that back. I'm going to give you a chance to walk that 
that claim back. That can't be what the purpose of journalism is, right? Because I have a whole bunch of, uh, I have a whole bunch of shoelaces in my closet and I'd like to tell you all about them. Uh, some of them are black, some of them are brown, some of them are gray. They're all different, you know, they have all different textures to them. Some of them have these little plastic things at the end, right? So clearly that can't be what journalism is about. So that's why I was gonna give you a chance to walk back that remark. Yeah, I would say that I always, you know, I'd like to retreat to the point that it's important that you're not, in, in, in my business, that you not be too preoccupied with consistency. Um, but- Indeed. Um, Indeed. The, um, I mean, you know, about important, about things that are important, about subjects of urgent or non-urgent public interest, I guess. Yeah, Not that's exactly right. I think that's, I, I, of course, I knew that's what you would say. Although if like somebody- And to make that determination on our behalf, right? Um, to, to do the curating function of deciding what those things are or to have, or to reflect yeah, somebody- Yeah, well, we've a lot of feedback. And we've all, you know, newspapers have always gotten a lot of feedback, but now the feedback is very direct. I wanted to separate out two different issues that were raised by Scott here in, in light of that. So let's just take you know the reporter who knows what the politician X is doing is racist. So the reporter might think, you know, I think it's really important for me to frame this in a way that the audience understands this is racist. Be that's an informing function. It's not stuff you necessarily didn't know. It's framing the world so that you see it through the lens, right? You see it in a certain yeah. way. So it's, and often what that means is showing you stuff in the past uh, and connecting stuff in the past to what's going on now, even stuff in the relatively recent past. But your point is in doing, performing that function, there are lots of different rhetorics you might use to basically perform that function. Some of them are very aggressive. Some of them are very in your face. Some of them are indirect, right? And so we both have a question of what are, what are the relevant functions of different parts of the media? And also what are the appropriate rhetorics they use when they, when they perform those functions? That's closer, I think, to what, you, what your view is. Would I, am I right? Or am I straw manning you again? Are you talking to me or Scott? You, you. Oh yeah, no, I think that's about right. But I, but I guess I don't. I mean, I think that you know, what's if your your goal is to have people believe you, and so, right. You know, maybe that works because you're screaming them, or maybe it works because you're being really subtle and in different stories that may be different. If you don't have credibility, then it doesn't matter how well you organize the story. Um, you know, I don't think that's actually true. Like having oh, come from a place with no credibility. Like right. I started, you know, when, when I arrived at BuzzFeed, we were and still are the world's leading cat website. Right. With zero credibility. And except with cats, of course. But yeah, you know, and and I not that we had sort of negative, not people distrusted us. Right. It was just trust wasn't really an axis we were being rated on. And, you know, we told clearly well, and that caused people to trust the stories, even if they didn't really know who we were. And I think, I do think trust is important, but it's not the only thing. You don't have to trust the speaker, you have to trust the story is what you're saying. Yeah. Right. Uh, all right, very good. There are lots of ways of achieving trust. Uh, so the second thing I want to talk about is another really interesting you, thing you said about whether Trump is just a passing phase and whether um, uh, Jay Rosen is basically, the, the clock is telling time correctly now. No reason to know whether it will tell time correctly in the future which is a claim that Trump is a creature of television. And uh, we have no way of knowing whether or not this is the, the future. So I, I wanted to ask you questions about that. So the first question is, um, why doesn't Trump demonstrate to us that television has never left? That is, television is still the dominant medium through the, uh, the uh, persuasion of audiences, the production of news, the creation of spectacle, um, Right. In other words, what he showed us was that we were all wrong, that we all thought it was the internet, but actually it turns out most people aren't getting their news that way. They're getting it through television. And to the extent that, that the internet matters, it's video. It's video it's on the internet. So that all of the various forms of display and spectacle that he's demonstrated are going to be with us for a while. They're not going away immediately. What do you think about that thesis? I mean, I think the internet you know, his brain has been kind of melted by the internet and the thing that he is bringing to television is a bunch of crazy stuff he learned from Twitter. So it's, I mean, it's, yeah. it's complicated. I mean, print always had a relationship to television too, but yeah, I think, right. yeah, the power of television, the power of imagery. I mean, I also think though that it's hard to predict. Like, I think that 
as a business, the television industry, you know, the newspaper industry's best year, like it's the peak revenue, I think was like 2002 or 2003. It was long after everybody had said the industry was collapsing, Right. was the peak. And, you know, television keeps hitting. I mean, there is this, I mean, you know, there are, there, you know, the Today Show is still a great business, but their audiences are getting older every year and they're smaller every year. And I do think that there is, my own view, I don't know, is that the predictions of the collapse of kind of like broadcast television as we know it were premature, but not wrong. Yeah, but um, I just wanted to distinguish between broadcast television, which is a particular business, yeah. and the medium of television, which can exist on streaming services, yeah, it can exist yeah. in YouTube clips. You see what I mean? Yes, and, no, and I agree with you that way. that had a kind of enduring power that we, yeah, that people that like internet people like me at least underestimated. Yeah, and since politicians are all about uh, impression, spectacle, uh, emotion, all the things that you do if you're a demagogue, right? Uh, they're going to still cling to television or rather the me media of video. Let me use video instead of television, yeah. it's confusing, as a way to do their stuff. Uh, For sure, but it's also a product is this very specific moment of, of celebrity culture right. and in the first decade of the 20th century. I mean, The right. Apprentice is just vastly the most important part of his biography. Um, and the thing that created you know, the version of him that exists for most people. And so there, you know, and so when you think like, who's the next Trump? Like, I don't know if like Tom Cotton is gonna get a reality show made, I mean, no, you know, there's not even broadcasting stuff that's viewed by as many people as The Apprentice was viewed by back then. Right, I mean, but what you're telling me is, I mean, cause I'm really asking about the, the Trump media interaction as the producing a current kind of politics. And I'm thinking about the future of it. That's what your remarks earlier led me to think about. Well, so politicians are very agile. Some of them are charismatic, some of them are not, but they're always looking for the next big chance. They're always looking about how to grow constituencies, how to have effects. So one would assume that even if Trump is, uh, leaves the stage, that the basic lessons he's teaching people, those lessons will be picked up by other people. And that's why the vid video, that's why the visual medium seems to me to be, continue to be important, even oh, if it's yeah. streaming services rather than, you know, the broadcast. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I think, you know, look at, a, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's Instagram is right. like maybe the best instance of what that is if you're trying to speak to younger people and the emerging majority. Yeah, I mean, and know. the other thing is there's a sense in which Trump really, Trump's conception of fame, I mean, I think The Apprentice, what everyone says, it may be that the, I never watched The Apprentice. I mean, lots of people never watched The Apprentice, the same way that not everybody reads The New York Times. But the culture of celebrity, it's But just to cut you off, hold on, but just to cut yeah. you off, way more people watch The Apprentice than read The New York Times. Like you may not have watched it, but like real numbers of people watch The Apprentice. Sure. Anyway. But I, you know, more people probably watch House and Garden television than the New York Times too. Yeah. But, but I mean, the point I'm making is a little different, which is that um, maybe the culture of celebrity is not just the culture of The Apprentice, it's the culture of the internet. That is, there's an internet culture of celebrity, which is the one that's around us everywhere. We see in, in young people, particularly, yeah. figuring out how to, how to surf that culture of celebrity. And maybe that's what we have to look forward to when thinking about politics. Yeah, I think that's right. I think the way the fandoms are sort of the, the way in which, you know, the way in which, you know, people who love Beyonce or, you know, are a very powerful fandom on the internet and like, what do not cross them. Um, right. And I think the shape of politicians followings online is often, you know, mirrors, mirrors that. So basically we're looking forward to is not Trump culture, but Stan culture. Yeah, Stan totally, culture which is really scary in various ways. Yeah. And some of Trump, and there is a sort of Stan culture and it's part of Trump supportive support certainly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is I think this is really interesting stuff, and I wish we had two more hours to talk about it, but unfortunately, we're going to have to call it a day. Uh, Sandy, back to you. Thank you, thank you, Jack. Thank you, Ben. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, we 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 were tempted, I suspect, as we sign off here, and to say thank you to invite you to come back again. Um, it's really been a pleasure. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks. It's nice to see you.